Praise God. So today we conclude the series Lessons from the Life of Joseph. Today's sermon is The Science of Waiting Well, part two of what we studied last week. Praise God. Last week I spoke on the science of waiting well, how to wait correctly while we are in the season of waiting, while we are in the waiting period. I mentioned that the waiting period is the season that God uses to train us and to build us up. The season where we are waiting for our change to come. It is the season where we anticipate the arrival of the coming conclusion to our pain, the coming conclusion to our struggle. I also mentioned that while we are in the season of waiting, there is a science to the waiting. There is an art to the waiting. There is a way of waiting that we must follow, a way of waiting that honors and pleases God. There are some things also that we need to stay away from, things that prolong our stay in the season of waiting. However, we must also know that waiting isn't just about avoiding things. Waiting for our breakthrough, waiting for our change to come also requires for us to play our part. There are things that we must do. When Joseph was waiting for his dreams to come to pass, he wasn't just avoiding things, he was doing things. He was getting to work, praise God. So what should you be doing while you are in the season of waiting? What are the things that contribute to the science of waiting well? Remember that our anchor scripture for this series has been 1 Peter 5.10. Let's go to 1 Peter 5.10. 1 Peter 5.10 says, And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. This is a promise that God has promised us But in order for this promise to be fulfilled, there are some things that we need to carry out. There are some conditions for verse 10 to come to pass that we see in previous verses. So if we go to 1 Peter 5, 6 to 9, the verses just before the promise. Let's go to 1 Peter 5, 6 to 9. I want you to see this. And contained in in this passage are the factors that will help and contribute to us waiting well and push us closer to that day of breakthrough. Verse 6 says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert like a roaring lion. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith. For you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore support strengthen and establish you praise God so in order to receive the promise in order for God the God of all grace who has called us to his eternal glory for him to restore us support us and strengthen us and establish us the first thing that we must do while we are in the waiting is to humble ourselves humble ourselves verse 6 says humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you in due time this passage says humble yourself and when you humble yourself God will lift you up the word time in this passage is the Greek word kairos which means the appointed time just at the right time meaning this passage is telling us when we humble ourselves God will lift us up just at the nick of time just at 
the right time. The lifting won't be sooner than God's will, but you are guaranteed that your lifting will never be too late. It will always be on time. The time when everything will make sense. The time when you can handle the blessing. There's some blessings that if God gave it to you now, it will scatter your life. He needs you to mature. He needs you to become all that he has called you to be so that you can receive that blessing. And that time is the kairos time, the appointed time. But we must humble ourselves in order to see this kairos moment. So what is it to humble ourselves? How do we humble ourselves? We humble ourselves by inviting God into the situation that we find ourselves in. Not relying on our own wisdom, not relying on our own strength, not relying on others, not relying on the promises of that person and that person, but surrendering to God and letting him know that, God, I need your help. I can do nothing without you. This is how we humble ourselves. God is waiting for us to surrender everything to him. Why? Because the battle is not ours. It belongs to the Lord. 2 Chronicles 20, 15. It says, the battle is not yours, but it is God's. God wants you to trust him with your battles and with your struggles. He wants you to trust him when your back is against the wall. But I get it. Sometimes it's hard to submit a battle that you can see in front of you to a God that you cannot see. It's very difficult. You see the bills, you you see the drama, you see this and that, but you can't see God. So yes, I get it. There is a difficulty to be like, God, I surrender it to you, but you can't see him. And this is the problem because humans tend to trust what they can see more than what they cannot see. They cling on to what they can see. They cling on to what naturally makes sense. They cling on to people. They cling on to the promises of the government to people. But we are spiritual beings. And it is the spirit realm that takes precedence. As Christians, we are not moved by what we see or how we feel. We must humble ourselves in faith and give God everything that has been weighing us down. God doesn't want us to seek alternatives or shortcuts. God wants us to invite him into the battle because he wants to reveal his love and his power in your life. This is why he wants you to invite him in so that he can have his way, so that he can be glorified through your life. I don't know about you, but I would love for God to show off in my life. And the only way God can show off in your life is when you submit the battle to God. You can't fight your battle better than the creator of the heavens and the earth. Praise God. God fought for Joseph. Joseph's life is the case study we're looking at. And God fought for Joseph. Joseph did not have to lift up a sword. He did not have to fight anyone. He did not have to raise his voice. He also didn't do anything out of the ordinary, anything extraordinary when he was in the struggle. But God lifted him up out of the struggle. Why? Because he humbled himself under the mighty hand of God. And God moved on his behalf. God exalted him. God fought the battle for him because Joseph submitted the battle to God. Joseph could have decided to be angry against God. He could have been bitter against God and said, God, you showed me these dreams, but my situation does not match these dreams. But no, God, but Joseph humbled himself. He didn't feel sorry for himself. 
He didn't call a pity party and say, oh, look at my life. Look at what has happened. That is not to trivialize what you're going through or what you've been through. But there has to be a point where you say enough is enough and you humble yourself and God, take control. I cannot do it anymore. Joseph humbled himself and it's those who humble themselves that are lifted up. James 4.10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. How many of you want to lift in in this place? Humble yourself. Humble yourself. James says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. That is a guarantee. All you need to do to bring to this equation is humbleness and God will lift you up. In the Bible, we see various examples of people that humbled themselves and cried out to God and their cries always moved God to action. It always moved God to move on their behalf. We have an example in Exodus 2, 23 to 25. Let's turn there. Exodus 2, 23 to 25. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, years passed and the king of Egypt died. But the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew and knew It was time to act. Therefore, today, I encourage you to cry out to your heavenly father. Begin to invite him into your battle because it is your time for lifting. I said it is your time for lifting in the name of Jesus. The second thing we must do in the waiting, while we're in the waiting period, according to the prescription that we see in first peter 5 6 to 9 the second thing we must do is cast our anxiety on him because he cares for you so not only are we to avoid fear like i said last week but we are to surrender it to him so that he can intervene you can't carry the baggage any longer You can't rise because the baggage is too heavy for you. God wants you to let go of the anxiety. He wants you to let go of the overanalyzing. He wants you to let go of absolutely everything and submit it to him. He doesn't want you to hold on to these things any longer. But listen, when when you submit your issues to God, when you submit your anxiety, when you submit your fear to God, stop, keep on taking it back from him. Too many of us submit our struggles and our pain to him, and then next week we're like, ah, let me take that one concerning my health. Yeah, thank you, God. Yeah. Then when we can't take it no longer, we say, no, God, take it. And we keep going back and forth. It becomes a cycle of anxiety where we keep giving it to God, then we take it back from him. God wants you to get your anxiety, put a first class stamp on it, address it to him with no return address. That's what he wants you to do. Submitting your anxiety to God is showing God that you trust him. It's a form of humility that God, this one, I don't know how to do it. So I submit it to you. God wants to carry your burden so that you don't have to carry it. It's like whenever me or my, my family will go to Nigeria, there's this service where 
you land, they look for your bags for you, um, you, you just give them the ticket, they look for the bag for you, you're sitting down, you're chilling, they look for your bag, when they get your bags, they load it into the car for you, you know, you don't have to sweat, you don't have to stress, you have someone doing all the stuff for you. It's enjoyable, it's nice. As soon as you hit the roads, there's going to be chaos, but at least in the airport, you can prep for the, the chaos. In the same way, why not give this baggage that has give, been giving you sleepless nights, this baggage that has been stressing you out? There is someone, your heavenly father, who wants to carry this baggage for you. Why are you still carrying it? If we pay for services or for, for our lives to be easy and all that, why can't we do this one that is free? God is going to deliver someone today in the name of Jesus. God wants to carry your baggage because he, he, he deeply cares about you and everything concerning your life. I always joke around, he, he, he numbered the hair on your head knowing it will fall out. That's how much attention he put into it. He cares deeply about you. Not only is he your God, but he is your heavenly father. A heavenly father. Joseph probably couldn't understand why his life was going the way it did. He probably recounted everything he did in life, trying to understand his predicament, trying to see where he sinned and where he got it wrong. But the most important thing is that he did not allow his confusion and anxiety to weigh him down and stop him. In fact, Joseph conducted himself in a way where you could tell he surrendered everything to God. He conducted himself in a way where he trusted that God will fulfill the purpose and plan in his life. Therefore, the way we cast our cares onto God is when we get to a place where we say, we know we can't, we don't know what's going on. We can't sort this out by ourselves. God, I entrust it to you. Have your way. I surrender everything to you because I know you are a covenant-keeping God and you cannot fail. When you've done that, that's when you know you have casted your cares onto God. When you don't know what's going on, but you've surrendered it to God. It's like, God, I trust you. I don't know what's going on, but I trust you. I trust you. This is important because like I said last week, when we remain in a state of fear and anxiety, it hinders our ability to move. It hinders our ability to get to work. It hinders our faith and it causes us to doubt. And the person who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. I'm not saying that as a Christian, we won't face anxiety. Of course, we will face anxiety. We have emotions. We will, we, there will be times of anxiety and fear. When you have humbled yourself and, and you have gotten your heavenly father involved in the situation and you trust that he will come through for you knowing that he has an unbeatable track record, you will come out of that anxiety quicker than someone that has not submitted the battle to him. You will be fearful but then your spirit man will kick in. Therefore, it means how much have you fed your spirit man when you face these situations? We will know them by their fruits. There are people that face incredibly wild situations. At first, they're anxious, but they get on with it and they see the results of their heavenly father moving in. 
That's how you beat anxiety, by filling your spirit man with the word and the promises of God. The word of God is not fairy tales. The word of God is living and active. The third principle found in 1 Peter 5, 6 to 9, that we must carry out in the waiting is to discipline ourselves and keep alert. Why? Because like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Every single day, morning and night, the devil is looking for people that he can destroy, that he can devour, that he can mess up so that they will not fulfill destiny. Every single day, whether you like it or not, whether you're awake or asleep, he is active. And he does this by using various tricks and schemes to trip us up as we are waiting for our change. He tries to present alternatives that look nice, that are, you know, gold on the outside, but when you rub it, the gold comes off. Not all things that glitter are gold. The grass on the other side is not greener. It's just that you haven't seen the snakes in the grass on the other side. You haven't seen the dog mess in the grass on the other side. From from a distance, it looks nice. The grass looks green, but inside is cat waste, dog waste, and snakes. Never look for alternatives to what God is giving you. It's the devil's mission to give you alternatives so that he can delay your breakthrough. He wants to delay the the coming conclusion because he knows the significance of that day. He knows that if you reach that day, it's a wrap. It's a wrap. Just think about it. Why is the devil so active? Why is he fighting me so much? It's because he knows that If you reach that day, you will become a mighty man, a mighty woman for God. Some of you don't believe it. No, no, some of you don't believe it. I'm not even asking for applause. I actually mean this statement. Some of you don't believe it. You need to get to a place where you recognize that The life you're in right now, there is more. There is a life that you cannot describe or comprehend. And the funny thing is, is that the devil knows that there's such a life for you. But some people don't know that about themselves. That wasn't even my notes, but that is for someone. Come to that revelation. Praise God. Praise God. The devil will even try and take people out completely because he knows the impact of their destiny. When my mother was pregnant with me, the doctors, she was pregnant, went for a checkup, and then there was a lady there. My mom was feeling funny about the person and the woman said, oh, what side, what side of the baby's head? Wait, where's the, um, the baby's head? She was asking, what side is the baby's head? And innocently, she told the woman, oh, it's on this side. And the woman touched the stomach. The next time my mom went to visit, they said there's no baby inside. This is a phantom pregnancy. I'm here now, anyway. (laughs) The devil saw my destiny. And he tried to take man out from from even before 
entering earth. 2006, coming out of Romford Station, some guy jumped behind me. I had my headphones on. I thought it was one of my friends because a lot of us lived in Romford, Essex. Jumped. And I just felt some blunt stuff on my face, neck, arm. Didn't know what was going on. Saw the guy run off. Then two guys in front of me said, oh, are you all right, mate? I looked down, blood everywhere. The guy had stabbed me with scissors. Not knife, scissors. That's next level. I didn't have beef with anyone. I wasn't any gangster or anything like that. The guy was, had mental issues. And they had caught him doing it to, I think, the seventh person in the shopping center. I was number six. What am I saying? All these traumas that you've experienced are indicators of where God is taking you. The trauma that you're going through right now. Stop saying, my life is finished. Oh. No, 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 no. Your life is getting interesting. Your life is getting interesting because you're getting closer to where God is calling you to and the devil is panicking and he's trying to take you out. For one minute, begin to magnify your heavenly father. Begin to worship him. Begin to thank him. Thank him that he kept you when the enemy tried to destroy you. Begin to thank him. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for keeping us. We thank you, oh God. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we need to be alert. We need to, to be disciplined. Because the enemy is prowling around looking for people to destroy. In fact, when we are undisciplined, it's like we are indirectly helping to delay our breakthrough. But the good news is that we can avoid the traps of the enemy. And the way we avoid those traps is by being disciplined, alert, and having awareness of the devices that the enemy uses against us. The devices of the enemy comes in various forms. The enemy doesn't use a blanket approach to attack people. The devices that he uses won't be the same for everyone. This is why we must be alert and pay attention to the subtle ways the enemy tries to trip us up. For Joseph, it came in the form of sexual temptation. But Joseph didn't give in. He was disciplined and alert and chose to honor God. In fact, Joseph acted straight away. He didn't allow himself to think about the temptation. He resisted it from the jump. He, he dismissed the temptation right from the beginning. Genesis 39, 9 says, My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? If it was some other people in this situation, they, they probably would have said, it was my boss's wife. I couldn't disobey her command. What was I supposed to do? I didn't want to lose my job. You'll be surprised there's people that will compromise their faith because of money, because of this, because of that. But Joseph knew it was better to lose something than to compromise. I want you to know it is better to lose a job, better to lose a contract, better to lose an opportunity. It is better to lose friends than to compromise and sin against God. You will pay for it later. Let integrity, integrity always be your first and only response. 
Opportunities will always come. New contracts, new friends will always find their way to you when you honor God because God rewards integrity. Integrity shows him you can be trusted. In fact, let's go back to Nigeria. I love Nigeria. Don't. I do, I do, I do. It was Nigeria that saved my life, but we'll get into that another time. In Nigeria, the formula for success, if you have a business and you want to do well in Nigeria, there's just one thing you need to be known for. What is that? No, no, no. Integrity. I'm being serious. Once you find a mechanic that has integrity and will tell you these brake pads are 10,000 naira and they're 2,000, you will stick to him. When you find a tailor that has integrity and will tell you that this material is from Sweden, but it came from Niger, you will stick with him. What am I trying to say? Integrity attracts opportunities. Integrity causes God to trust more into your hands. That's what integrity does. Praise God. Praise God. But that's not all Joseph did. He disciplined himself and resisted Potiphar's wife by distancing himself from her. Genesis 39, 10 says, she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day. But he refused to sleep with her and he kept out of her way as much as possible. We stay alert by distancing ourselves from the temptation. We discipline ourselves by starving anything that feeds the temptation. Not only that, we need to learn how to flee when we find ourselves in sticky situations. Stop standing in the midst of temptation and saying you will not fail because you are a mighty man of God. That's pride. And great men have fallen because of that. Great women have fallen because they felt they could withstand the temptation. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, Stay away from every kind of evil. Stay away from every kind of evil. Whatever tempts you, stay away from it. When you don't stay away from temptation, sinful action soon follows. We have to discipline ourselves. We have to be alert. We have to be on guard from every sight of temptation. Never forget that sin and and disobedience puts the coming day of conclusion on ice. It prolongs the season of waiting. What happens when you put food in a freezer? It extends the expiration date. Therefore, sin is a freezer that kills your fire and extends the struggles and hardship. That's what sin does. It's a freezer and it will extend your troubles. When we refuse to give in to temptation and we choose to walk in integrity, we are carrying out the next principle in 1 Peter 5, 6 to 9, which is resist him, him being the devil, steadfast in our faith. When we resist the devil, we resist the devil when we refuse to compromise. We resist the devil when we refuse to do things outside of God's will. We resist the devil when we obey God and stick to God's game plan and stand steadfast in our faith and on his word. We resist the devil when we use scriptures to expose the enemy's lies and temptations. It is only the word of God, the sword of the spirit, part of the full armor of God that is the most effective way to defeat Satan's lies and temptations. Praise God. Resisting the devil is saying no to sin. 
Resisting the devil is you choosing obedience regardless of how you feel. And it's obedience that sets you up to experience victory. It's your obedience in the waiting period. It's your, it's your obedience in the struggle that causes you to experience the conclusion of that struggle. James 4, 7 says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So when you resist the devil by being obedient to God, the devil has to flee. As you're being obedient, the devil has to flee. To flee doesn't mean that the devil walks away. No, no, no. To flee means to run away from a place or situation of danger. Listen to this. That means that every time you resist the devil, he is in dangerous territory and has to take off because your obedience has created an atmosphere that the enemy cannot stand and as a result causes him to flee. Uh. You'll get it when you finish your Sunday lunch. When you're obedient, you create an atmosphere that the devil cannot stand. Okay. Let me just be moving. While we're in the waiting, in conclusion, I have so much, but it's 10 to 11. While we're in the waiting, if we do all these things that I have mentioned from 1 Peter 5, 6 to 9, if we humble ourselves, if we cast our anxieties on God, if we are alert and sober-minded, if we resist the enemy standing firm in the faith, then the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you make you strong firm and steadfast amplified version said and make you what you ought to be in the name of jesus can i go on in the time we're in the waiting period most definitely there's going to be times where we're discouraged even when we have faith, even when we're being obedient, there's going to be discouraging times. So here are five truths that you need to hold on to while you're in the waiting. The first truth is that God loves you. Psalms 86, 15 says, But you, O Lord, are a God of compassion and mercy, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. God loves you more than you can love yourself. He loves you unconditionally. That means he doesn't love you according to these conditions. No, he loves you unconditionally. Therefore, there is nothing that can separate you from his love or stop the beautiful outcome and consequences of his love for you. The love that God has for you is greater than any, than any father than you, that you can imagine. A good father wants his children to succeed and do better than he did. A good father will take care of his children and provide for them. A good father will lay his life down for his children. And if that is what an earthly father would do, how much more your heavenly father? There is no earthly father, no matter how great he is, that can outdo God. Listen, you may have had bad experiences with fathers and father figures, but I want you to know that you can trust God with your life. You can trust that God will be faithful. He won't leave you. He won't let you down. So right now, I pray that you will no longer see God through the lens of that father, that guardian that hurt you. I said, I pray for you right now that you will no longer see God through the lens of that father that hurt you. I pray that you will see God through the lens of the gospel, knowing that he sent his only son to die for you. Why? Because he thought that you were worth dying for. That's the kind of father our heavenly father is. The second thing you should hold on to is that God has a plan for you. 
We all know Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. When it comes to your purpose and your destiny, when, when, when you're being discouraged, remember when it comes to your destiny, there is a detailed action plan that God has put together. And the plan that he has put together for your life is great, but it will stretch you. Joseph's whole experience in slavery was a time of real stretching, but in the end, everything that God had planned had come to pass. Everything worked out for his good. In the same way, we know that in all things, the good things, the bad things, and the ugly things, in all things, God works for the good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. It's just like when you're putting the cake together, when you have the separate ingredients, butter, sugar, egg, vanilla extract, flour, milk. When you taste these individual ingredients on their own, they taste horrible, probably except from the milk. You, you don't eat salt like it's peanuts. You don't chuck sugar in your mouth like it's nuts. All these things would taste horrible. Raw egg would taste horrible. But when you put all these things in a bowl and you mix it together and you put it in the oven and you add some heat, you add some trauma, you add some trouble, you add some hot fire, it comes out, it rises up and it becomes something tasty. It becomes something that is delicious. In the same way, God collects the good, the bad, the ugly and he puts it in a bowl called life and he stirs it up and what comes out is a beautiful outcome that ends in your victory which means that no experience is wasted experience everything is working together for your good tell your neighbor everything is working out for your good Praise God. So whenever you're in that struggle, just remind yourself everything is working out for my good. Right now, I'm writing my story. Whenever me and my wife would get discouraged, those times when we were renting and we wanted our own property, we always encourage ourselves and say, look, we're writing our story right now. We're writing a story that will bless people. We're writing a story that, in fact, people won't even believe us. They'll think we're adding to the story. In the same way, you too are writing your story. And one day, people will be blessed by your story in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Everything will eventually make sense. It doesn't make sense now, but it will. If God is the author, it will make sense. There's some books that we've read. There's some TV series that we've watched, and we're wondering what's going on. And in the end, it's like, oh, that was a rubbish ending. But with God, the ending is going to be powerful. The ending is going to be beautiful. It's going to be sweet. And this is exactly what happened when Joseph was reunited with his brothers. Genesis 4, 5 to 9 says, But don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting again. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive, to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all G Egypt. Three times Joseph told his brothers that it was God that sent him to Egypt. It was in God's plan that from the beginning, that Joseph will be in Egypt and all his brothers were, were just actors in the grand scheme of things. Joseph had come to a place where he knew that where, what he went through was there was a greater good for what he had gone through. Everything now made sense as to why he went through what he went through. God has sent me to tell you this. Maybe what you're going through is preparing you to be the answer to a future problem. Maybe what you're going through is preparing you to be the deliverer of your family. Praise God. 
Hallelujah. Hey, I got so much. I got so much. Sit down, sit down, sit down. I hope you don't mind. It's worth it. It's worth it. That roast chicken can't wait. It can't wait. The third truth you must hold on to is that God has heard you. Psalms 34, 17, the Lord hears his people. When they call to him for help, he rescues them from all their troubles. Psalm 145, 18 to 19, the Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him. Double emphasis. Yes, to all who call on him. In truth, he grants the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries for help and rescues them. God has heard every cry, cry, every prayer, every petition. He has seen every tear that you have wiped from your face. He has heard every thought that you have thought. He has heard every murmuring of your heart. Do not give up. Do not give up. Do not give up. If you haven't received the answer, if you haven't gotten the solution, it doesn't mean that God is ignoring you. Just keep praising him. Keep praising him like he's already done it. Keep thanking him as if you have already received it. And then when you do that, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Do not try and figure things out. Just be thanking him. Don't try and be analyzing things. That is not your job. You are the believer. God is the performer. You are the believer. God is the performer. When you believe, you activate God to perform. And he isn't sitting around doing nothing. God is in the background working for you. God is in the background leading you to the right place. God is in the background making crooked paths straight. God is dismantling the works of the enemy. And that leads me to the next truth. God is at work while you're waiting. God is at work on your behalf. Like I said, making crooked ways straight destroying the works of the enemy destroying altars of your father's house destroying altars of your mother's house when Joseph was taken into slavery God was in the background working to make sure that Joseph would be sent to not just any slave master but specifically Potiphar because God knew that Potiphar was a person that if he saw the leadership skill in Joseph he would give Joseph tasks to do that will help Joseph develop his leadership skills. God made sure that when Joseph was in the prison, Joseph would be divinely connected with Pharaoh's chief cupbearer who would eventually remember Joseph and Joseph would then have an audience with Pharaoh which will now lead to Joseph's breakthrough. Meanwhile, Joseph didn't know that God was putting all these things in the background. Therefore, the story of Joseph reminds us to trust God because in the same way God is working things out for your good every single day God is working God does not sleep nor does he slumber every even as you're listening now in the spirit realm God is moving things around for you God and his angels are doing this and they're doing that God has not forgotten you. 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 And as we conclude this series, the lessons of the life of Joseph. I promise I end in 10 minutes. These are the lessons. Number one, don't tell everyone your dreams and your plans. Not everyone smiling with you is your friend. Don't put everything on Instagram. Don't put everything on Twitter and and, and wherever. Don't put everything there. Try and have a private life. Number two, struggle is not a sign of punishment, but an opportunity for your character and capacity to be built. When you're in the situation, ask God, what am I supposed to be learning in this situation? What are the things I'm supposed to be learning? Number three, integrity 
Integrity is what made Joseph become what God called him to be. Number four, despite what Joseph was going through was not fair. And the situations that he was going through was created by others. He did not let his suffering kill his dream. Therefore, what you're going through, what you have been through that has been created by others, do not let your disappointments kill your dream. Rather, let it be determination to turn things around by the help of God. Number five, another thing we learn is that you won't appreciate the palace without the process. You won't appreciate the blessing without the process. Your, your story is sweeter when you've gone through some things. But I know some of you are probably saying that my story is already sweet. In fact, it's too sweet. God, come, come, come. Number six, facing one disappointment after the another, another doesn't mean God is not with you. Throughout Joseph's life, we saw that God was with him. Genesis 39, 2, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. Genesis 39, 21, the Lord was with him. In the same way, God is with you. And that concludes the series, the lessons from the life of Joseph. Let's stand up, magnify the name of the Lord. Just bless him, thank him for the word. Thank him, thank him, thank him. Thank him, thank him for the word that you've received. Ask him that you won't just be a hearer, but you will be a doer. Begin to ask the Holy Spirit to help you to humble yourself. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to humble yourself. The grace to cast all your anxiety on God. God, help us to cast all our burdens on you. And now ask the Holy Spirit to help you to discipline yourself and keep alert. Begin to decree and declare, I will not fall for the traps of the enemy. And right now we resist you, Satan. We resist you and we stand firm on the word of God. We say no to sin. We say no to disobedience. Lord, we thank you for the word that has gone forth. I thank you, Lord, because you have set people free. I thank you, Lord God, that there are going to be testimonies, oh God. We bless your name. We thank you, oh God. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Make some noise for Jesus.